okay, maybe uh, you know, tell us a little bit about this event in 1986. Maybe set the stage for us. Certainly. So the key thing to remember here is what was going on in the world at the time. This was the height of the Cold War. And in Europe especially, there was a lot of fear that nuclear war was right around the corner. Uh, you know, annihilation of humanity. That was the fear. And at the same time, we saw a major rise in secularism. And one of the reasons for that was that there is a narrative being spun that religion leads to warfare and violence. That was one of the main uh, talking points of the communists, for example, that so many wars are fought over religion that society would be a much better place if there was no religion. Uh, you know, a good example of this is the song Imagine by John Lennon. You know, imagine no religion, you know, this peaceful, perfect right. world. All right. So that was the narrative. The world was afraid. Nuclear war seemed imminent. And religion was being spun as being the a tool of violence and something that leads to more warfare and more violence. And Pope John Paul II really wanted to kind of turn this narrative on its head. So we felt, first of all, it was really important that there be some sort of major action towards world peace. And he thought that religion could be used as a vehicle to promote this. So he had this idea of having uh, different religious leaders from around the world come together, and he chose the place to be Assisi in Italy, the home of St. Francis. And it's because St. Francis has been known historically as the man of peace. Uh, you know, peace was something that was very central to him. Plus, he also was known for, you know, having dialogues with the, uh, you know, different leaders from other faiths. You know, for example, he had a long dialogue with a Muslim leader in uh, Egypt. So this seemed like the, the ideal place to do it in the shadow of Francis of Assisi and not in Rome. Uh, he didn't want it to be done in Rome because number one, if it was done in Rome, it, it wouldn't be like a level playing field, so to speak. Uh, world leaders going to Rome is a little different than the meeting together on a more neutral territory. Even though Assisi wasn't neutral territory, it, it was a different message than meeting up in Rome. So that was his goal, to, to pray for world peace mm -hmm. and to show the world that religion could be a tool for peace rather than something that leads to more warfare and violence. That was what he wanted to have happen. Um, so like I said, religious leaders from around the world were invited to this. Uh, simultaneously, a number of governments around the world uh, declared there would be no fighting that day. So this was a request that the Holy Father made that there be a general ceasefire, you know, a violence around the world. And a number of places, hotspots where there was violence declared there would be no fighting that day. Although a few of them ended up breaking that. Uh, breaking that. But the other thing that Pope John Paul II was concerned about, he didn't want to give the impression of there being religious indifferentism. You know, the idea that all religions are the same, they're all equal. And that, by the way, was an idea that was getting a lot of traction, especially in, uh, you know, in, in anthropology and in some religious studies disciplines. That was around the time also when uh, Joseph Campbell and his books were very popular, The Power of Myth. And there's a lot of positive stuff in Joseph Campbell. I mean, there's some real insights in there. But at the same time, Joseph Campbell has this tendency to claim that all religions are saying the same thing. He looks at commonalities between them and argues they're all really the same. And we know as Christians that it cannot be true because if every religion is equally true, well, they all have contradictory beliefs. So that means that nothing is true, right? So Pope John Paul II wanted to avoid that. So he purposely planned the event and, and framed it like this. It was not religions of the world coming together to pray. No, that was not the idea. It was religions of the world being together to pray. So they weren't praying together, but they were being together to pray. That was the idea. So there'd be no prayer in common, but rather they'd meet up and then they would go to separate locations. And there in these separate locations, they would... Um, do prayers according to their own tradition. So that was the plan. That was the idea. And uh, in, in a little while, I'll show you a video of how this actually kind of unfolded and uh, hit upon some of the controversies that arose from it. But that was the intention. And I think it was a good intention to show that religion can be a vehicle for peace and that, you know, praying for peace is a positive thing. I get the intention there. Here's some concerns that I have with that. 
since some of these religions are calling on false gods, which according to scripture are demons, would this not be John Paul II inviting them to call on demons since he knows that they're not going to be calling on the one true God? So he was inviting them to pray. He was inviting them to pray however was comfortable to them. Um, but that really isn't the same as explicitly inviting them to call upon false gods. Um, prayer is something innate in human beings. There's something in us that longs for something greater than ourselves. And that's because every human being, whether they acknowledge it or not, is made in the image and likeness of God. And there's something in us that aspires towards, aspires towards, you know, connecting with this God. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the true religion of Christianity isn't embraced or known everywhere, but people still pray because that's something that's inherent inside of us. So inviting somebody to pray, um, what, what it's doing is respecting their dignity as people and respecting that they're doing something that's kind of programmed into us. You know, We're all meant to be religious beings one way or the other. Even atheists that I know of, some atheists become uh, almost religious in their zeal for atheism. So calling upon people to pray, something that's inherent upon us, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. And again, he wasn't inviting them to specifically pray to false gods, but to pray, however they feel comfortable. Yeah, and, and I get that, but it's kind of like a near occasion. If you know that they are going to be doing this, should you invite them? It's it's like for somebody that you know struggles with alcohol, you know, could you invite them over to a bar? Yeah, you, you could, you know, maybe you could just have pretzels and water or something, but you know, it's a near occasion of sin and they're probably going to sin in that occasion. Well, the, the other, the other point of it though, is this, a non-Christian praying isn't necessarily sinful to them. It isn't necessarily, because again, there's something inside of us that has this impulse to pray, to connect with the higher power. And if they're not connecting with the true God, they're still going to try and reach out to something. That's something programmed within us, and that's not necessarily sinful for them. Keep in mind that no religions were invited uh, that explicitly pray to dark forces. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, Satanists were not invited to participate. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, religions that are known for human sacrifice or known for a dark history of, of you know, of evil acts, none of those were invited. Now, the religions that were invited were ones that are generally seen as being pretty benign and that which we may have some level of commonality with to one degree or the other. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I would argue personally that not all religions are demonic or false. Um, I tend to believe, this is just my personal belief, that any religion that has existed for thousands of years and sustained human civilizations probably has some core of truth to it. There's something to it that sustains people, some truth at the very core. Now, there may be many falsehoods mixed in. That is mm -hmm. possible. Sure. But that doesn't take away from the fact that there may be some truth at the heart of it. Sure. Um, you did a great video a week or so ago, Michael, in which you talked about St. Justin Martyr mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what he called the seeds of the Logos. Yeah. You know, many cultures, uh, many religions have these seeds of God, seeds of Logos in them. Now, they need to be refined. They need to, need to be drawn out and Christianized, but there are seeds of truth all over the place. And, and why that is, that, that's an interesting discussion in and of itself. Mm -hmm. There was a theory. It, it's not very popular anymore, but there's something to be said for it. There's a theory that originally, if you go back to the very beginnings of human civilization, people were originally monotheists, and they had the original religion of Adam. And then as time went on, as hum humanity became separated, um, it devolved into other things, such as polytheism and animism and whatnot. Uh, that was a theory that you find some of the church fathers espousing. And, um, you know, there were some great writers, Catholic writers over the centuries who advocated this, mm. that there was originally one true religion, and then it kind of devolved into all the different varieties. But that also explains then why there are commonalities between different religions, why you find the same myths, the same stories in different religions, because they all come from the same true religion. Mm -hmm. Now, today, this theory is not very popular, and I think that's because we have a tendency to look at religion through the lens of evolution. You know, we we see things through the lens of evolution, so um, it looks to us like religions begin one way and evolve into being another, right? The monotheism is a later development, but it's very possible it's actually the other way around. Um, 
But at any rate, uh, I wouldn't jump to the conclusion that every being being prayed to at these events is necessarily a demon. It's possible that they're praying towards what they conceive God to be, and it's an erroneous conception. Mm -hmm. But still, if these prayers are being sent out to a higher power who they believe to be good, and it's in a spirit of good intentions, um, it's very possible that God hears their prayers. It's very possible. Mm -hmm. Now, that does not mean that we should not preach the gospel. We must always preach the gospel. We have a commandment to go out and baptize all the nations. That's essential. But at the same time, we shouldn't assume that everything non-Christian is automatically evil or demonic. Yeah, yeah. That's very helpful. And, I, you know, I read the speeches that John Paul II had with the event, and he does proclaim Christ to them. And so at the end of the event, he makes it known. He makes it very clear. And so I'll put that out. Yeah. I'll yeah. 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 So sure. 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 So, yeah, you have this video for us. Um, can you tell us who are maybe some of the participants? I know there are Orthodox representatives there, right. uh, Russian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, I think. Oh, yeah, there were, um, I think, I think there were 12 major religions <laughs> represented, but within them, there were like subgroups, like different denominations within Christianity. I know some of the main ones present. Um, there was the Patriarch of Moscow at the time. I think either the Romanian or Bulgarian, one or the other, one, the Romanian or Bulgarian Patriarch was there. The video, I think, it identifies who's who. Uh, I also know that there was a representative of the Patriarch of Constantinople. Yeah. The Patriarch himself could not be there, but he sent a representative. And then um, the Archbishop of Canterbury mm -hmm. was there, representing the Anglican Communion. Mm -hmm. And then there was also... Um, Jewish representatives, like the chief rabbi of Rome was there. Mm -hmm. uh, representing Hinduism, um, I believe it was the, the nephew of Gandhi, and then another uh, Hindu representatives. There were some Zoroastrians present. There were Native Americans present as well, two Native Americans. Uh, Muslims were present, and of course, Buddhists were present, led by the uh, Dalai Lama. And we'll get to that in a little bit later, because that became one of the main scandals of the event is what happened there. But Mm. Buddhists were present. Hey, thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button and the subscribe button. God bless.